Mike Cassidy, the co-host of the Fearless Commerce Podcast with Adam Silverman. Earlier this year, Adam and I sat down with Bridget Cornet at Signified's Flow Summit. Bridget was the Senior Director of Payments and Fraud at Groupon. We talked to Bridget about how that area of commerce has changed and will change in the coming years and how she's been navigating those changes to become one of the leading lights in the field. Bridget has since left Groupon, but her comments and observations that day are every bit as relevant today. This is the Fearless Commerce Podcast. This is the Fearless Commerce Podcast, a regular plunge into understanding why commerce leaders do what they do and how they manage to embrace fearlessness in the face of retail. Today, we're talking with Bridget Corney, uh, Director of Payment and Fraud at Groupon. Hi, so, guys. Hi, hey. Bridget. How's How it going? Good. Happy to be here. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thanks for coming to Flow. We are thrilled. Plus, I Groupon is just cool to me. I've, I've always, you know, from, from the beginning, found it to be a fascinating thing. And I've already admitted my love of Chicago. And so there's that whole thing going on, too. But... So this isn't about me. Maybe uh, yeah. maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you got, you know, what, what drew you to e-commerce and sort of how you ended up uh, doing what you're doing today. Sure. So I uh, started at Groupon in June of 2010. So I am almost 13 years wow. into my journey there. That's amazing. Groupon um, at that time was a really different place. It was kind of, I think, one of the first big tech companies yep. in, in Chicago after, yep. you know, the peak of the 2008 recession. Um, and we were really focused on a deal of the day. Um, that was kind of our core product offering was you sign up for an email um, and that email will get you a deal to a local merchant around, around you. And that concept kind of took off and we rolled out bunches of different cities. Um, I actually started in, at Groupon rolling out Bakersfield, California. Oh, yeah. So, hot, uh, hot spot. It, <laughs> literally. It was a hot Chet spot. Chet Atkins, isn't yeah. it? Or one of those, one oh, of those okay. fellows. Okay, you kind of have to research that. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. That's amazing. It was, it was a really cool time to be um, involved in e-commerce. It was really taking off. Um, and obviously, the company has evolved. And in, in, in that evolution, I've also evolved in my career. Um, I've taken on a couple of different hats throughout the, my journey, but eventually led me into uh, fraud prevention and payment operations. Um, I've been leading the the group there now for about five years, um, but before that was in the product role for our platform, and then I was an operations leader before that, and so kind of a bunch of different things. Wow. And Groupon's been really good to me that way. That's great. That's great. And so what is it about e-commerce or retail that keeps you interested? What what sort of motivates you to stay in the business? So I have had a love of, I think, fashion and, and retail and shopping like most, a lot of a lot of people. I don't think I'm alone in that. Yeah. Um, started. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Our economy needs it. Um, I started, did, spent all of my high school years working at Nordstrom, actually, and um, really got bit by the retail bug there. Everything about the entire experience. Yeah. Um, you walk in and you have a connection with somebody that you've worked with before. Um, the experience online when you are trying to filter to find the right dress or the right item. Um, all of those different aspects of retail kind of like drew me in. And then now, professionally, I think I'm finding so much of my and most consumers are spending so much of our time consuming not just at a Nordstrom or at a department store or something like that for for beauty or or clothes but also everyday items you know I'm you know out of paper towels let me click that right. really quick yep. or I need new floss and let me just I'll just, like subscribe to that so um what kind of keeps me around to answer your question I think is I personally and professionally now get to influence a small portion of that in my own way through my experiences of what I do every day. Um, I, I think that's just really cool to be able to tie that directly back to um, something that all of us, I don't know if we take for, for granted, but right. um, it's it's great part for yeah, me. Yeah, it's tangible. I remember when I worked in retail, I always felt pr uh, you know, proud of to go into the stores that my company ran. Yeah. And you know, I can actually yep. see the yep. thing and feel and, I, and people know the brand just like you started off. People know the brand and it gives you that 
that, that, you know, the great feeling of contributing to adding happiness and value to people's lives. So I can definitely totally. empathize with that. Yeah. I think still to this day, I quote something I learned in one of like the internships that I did at Nordstrom in my early days. Um, they had us read a book that John Nordstrom had wrote. Yeah. And it's, he writes about this principle of like doing what's right for the customer. Mm -hmm. And if you can back up why that decision that you made is right for the customer, you can't go wrong ever. And I still try and lead my teams that way and say, I trust you to make that whatever decision possible because of, um, because you made it with the customer in mind. And I think that kind of ties back to the larger idea of where e-commerce is right now and retail is right now is all based around this customer journey. Mm -hmm. right. I feel like I know that's kind of this buzzword, but everyone is focused, right, on right. customer journey, customer journey, making sure that's easy and simple. And um, that concept hasn't really been, has, it, has been around since, you know, 1901, right, when... Yep. Nordstrom was built or before that, right? Um, so I think that's kind of cool to kind of see it just come out in different technologies in different ways. That's interesting. You know, Nordstrom, any anytime you're a benchmark, you know, like everybody wants to be the Nordstrom of X Customers, or the Nordstrom yeah. of Y. Yeah. That's a pretty good sign. Yeah. Um, I feel like we went through that, you know, at, at Groupon too for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Being kind of a unique offering. Yep. Um, you, you know, we're a marketplace and that that's... There's certainly plenty of marketplaces out there now, um, but at the time, I think it was kind of a very unique thing. And certainly, there were competitors, and there, we could, you know, talk about that for a long time. But um, that was really cool too to kind of become synonymous, like with a a certain offering, like a Kleenex. You know, we were right, the, we right. were the Kleenex of tissues, yeah. but for you know marketplaces for yeah. a long time. So that was really cool too. You know, hearing your story, one question did pop into my head, which was, um, you know, your title includes payments and fraud. Yeah. And it seems to me that that's a pretty good pairing, but I'm not sure it's been a pairing for a long time, if you know what I'm asking. Is this, yeah. I mean, is there some new realization or a relatively new realization that those two things really go together? I think it's not new, but I think it's becoming more common. And what I mean by that is I think for a long time, we kind of kept these two things in a silo and we had payment, you know, data and we had cust or fraud data, right? And we were looking at loss associated with fraud and maybe right. we were looking at authorization for payments. And what I keep hearing at different events and in different networking with different merchants um, is really those two are so influenced by each other. And not only do they influence each other, but they also influence this larger concept of the customer journey and of the checkout experience. And that's why I feel like they kind of tie together operationally. They they run similarly. Mm -hmm. They have some tie over. But really, you can be better at payments or you can be better at fraud if you have more of a bigger, larger concept in, in mind when you're building out those teams. So. That does seem, that makes a lot of sense. That makes sense, yeah. Now, Adam, do you want to roll out the irrational fear question? Let's or? do it. And because <laughs> right, this is the, here we go. Because this I'm is so the excited. Fearless Commerce podcast, we must ask, what is your one irrational fear that you have? So well, there could be more than one. I The first thing that I thought of in my mind was um, I had braces when I was in seventh grade, when I was a freshman in high school, and like five years ago. I've had them three times in wow. my life, and so my... I think my mother's irrational fear also would be <laughs> I've spent so much money on your teeth. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you need, you need, I, I think so falling on my face and hurting my oh. teeth is really, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I don't mind. want to yeah, think about it. That's not, yeah. a, I don't want to. <laughs> no, yeah. an accident waiting to happen, a slip and a fall. So that's what I think of immediately. I don't want to spend any more time in the orthodontist chair. Yeah, or absolutely. Money. Well, sure. that's fair. I think that is very that's smart. That's irrational <laughs> yeah. that part right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so as we think about um, being fearless, what does the term fearless mean to you? So... I, when I was thinking through the word fearless, and and I know that um, Rebecca, you know, speaking, hearing her speak, and um, being able to kind of focus on this question for a while, and, and the word fearless, um, what struck me the most was that it you would assume that it means lack of fear, right? right? You don't mm -hmm. have fear, but really, what what it goes after is doing something without um, having that 
even though you are scared, right? right? Being brave and being bold and going through in the face of maybe adversity or obstacles. Um, so the kind of that juxtaposition of like what you think it should mean, but also what it really does mean, um, gives it so much like strength in, in, the, in the word. Yeah. Is there an example that in your life or your career that you can think of where you felt particularly fearless? Right now. Oh, on that's a great. Podcast. That's yeah. good. This is my first, I'm a first timer. So we're, welcome. we're such scary yeah. dudes. Yes. Yeah. Thankfully that I, you know, <laughs> so I have two great partners here. That would be that you guys have made it a lot easier, oh. but I felt very, you know, nervous going in. Not sure. that we aren't talking yeah. about things that that I talk about I'm all nervous the time. right now. Yeah, <laughs> <Same. laughs> but I think just saying it. Yeah. 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 And anything at work, like tell me your experiences yeah. at work. What there have to be some moments when either a big presentation, yeah. probably the first or, time, you know, that yeah. you email the CEO, yeah. you know, you want to yeah. say the right things. You want to do it in an effective way. Um, and what always goes through my mind in those situations and those scenarios is, you know, Right now is when you're going to be the most scared. Mm -hmm, right. You're going to do the thing and you're going to learn something. You're going to adapt in some way. And the next time you do it, you're not going to be as scared. You're going to be more fearless. And the only way to get from A to Z is to go through the rest of, of what's in between. Um, and so I kind of take the stance of like dive head first. And, and every day I think I feel fearless. I think it's a core part of every professional's job. No mm -hmm. one is a complete expert on every single topic. I mean, maybe yeah. there's somebody that is, but so much of being fearless is confidence in, in those, in those scenarios. I think that's so I true. That. Confidence that. is spot on. Yeah. I, uh, of all the things I write at Signified, the things that take me the longest are my Slack messages to the CEO. Yes, exactly. Right. I could write, a, you could give me a one pager on any topic and I could get it done in 15 minutes. But having to type a, a concise sentence to our CEO is like, even though he's a wonderful person and exactly. nice, you know, um, it's still, it's nerve wracking because you want, you don't, there's more of a different fear there, right? Of right. you want them to get the point across in a way that's effective. And um, that I think is also, that's a, a human yeah, fear, yeah. I think. Do you find that you um, change your communication style or um, or perhaps, uh, for me, I know uh, when I'm the best communicator is when I'm the most authentic and yeah. I'm just who I am, yeah. right? And regardless of the, you know, warts and other things that get in the way, um, tell us about like what that's like for you. I think um, I've certainly gotten better at it as I've gotten, had more experience. Mm -hmm. um, what I've really learned, I think, is um, being tailored in those messages to the audience has really helped because I've certainly had experiences where maybe I gave way too much, you know, um, inside baseball of the the inner workings of how our fraud works. And really, you know, they don't need to know all of those things. Right. But once <laughs> you start to understand how you can craft a message that is tailored for your audience, that is the main thing I think that I've gotten a lot of experience at and and been able to really be better at well that's great yeah that's good yeah. advice excellent uh, you know if we we're going to get back to e-commerce a little bit um a little a little more hardcore but um i'm wondering if you see anything in, in technology or maybe strategy any anything coming up in e-commerce that's bubbling up that's going to be a big accelerator or disruptor that we'll all be talking about at uh, maybe the next flow yeah i think there's a couple of a couple of like technologies that I are probably pretty buzzworthy, you know, AI and chat GPT mm -hmm. and going into like more of um, technology focused and based solutions and not that they weren't before, but maybe using different types of technology. But I think um, the larger thing that is is really changing is as a result of um, maybe you know, I hate to say the pandemic because I know we're kind of over talking about mm, that. Well, um, there's, we're still going to see ramifications and, and for consequences long, long for oh, yeah. <clears throat> tens of years. Right. And, and, you know, because of the past three years. And I think part of that is going to be in how m merchants adapt and change over and, and what our focus is on, um, those technologies are, are important and they're going to continue to change and they're, next year there'll be something new that we're all talking about. Um, but really what our focus, where our focus is at, I think is really the big like evolution and how those things can influence our focus and 
focus for what I'm seeing is really on customer journey and automating and making sure, like I said in kind of the beginning, that every time you're you're presenting a buy button, that it is the cleanest, quickest um, experience possible. And how do we get that to the next level using some of these technologies? Right. Yeah, that's the, the point to steer clear of technology for technology's sake, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Using it for the good, you know, bad always comes. That's yeah. why we're in fraud. But yep. <laughs> um, we're here to stop some of that and be aware of it and think of think for the long, long haul. But right. Um, you well, know. you know, funny you should mention because I, w- I was thinking of a question along the same lines, but about fraud and about risk, you know, consumer abuse. Mm. W- where do you see that going? Are you seeing things? I mean, is it is it uh, the oldest story or <laughs> is it constantly changing? And what do you see changing? I think in years past, maybe there's been one hot topic. I think 2022, maybe start of 2021, mm-hmm. like we we were all in on first party misuse, friendly fraud. Everybody talked about it ad nauseum. And then probably, you know, years before that, everyone wanted to talk about ATO and, and or account takeover. I think that was pretty hot topic. Um, what I think that's unique about right now is that all of these topics are right. top of mind for everyone. It's not like you know, your traditional run of the mill at ATO or whatever it might be has gone away. All of these things are peaking at this time um, due to, I think, a couple of factors. Um, one, you know, maybe lack of security or maybe more relaxed security, um, breached data, all of the things mm-hmm. that kind of in, in like started any of these pieces of or any of these fraud trends. Um, but we're seeing it at a we're seeing these fraudsters use those technologies that we talked about in ways that we haven't figured out how we were going to use them yet. They're right. kind of a st- ahead of the game mm-hmm. in those ways. Um, and so we need to adapt quicker because now, you know, they're winning in, in all of these different, um, they're able to capitalize on all these different fraud trends rather than just taking advantage of just one. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, scary. Yeah, that's that's an interesting insight. So any recommendations for... People that want to get into your line of business, whether it even be e-commerce or fraud and payments, what advice would you give someone who's looking uh, to follow in your footsteps? I think what has been most beneficial for myself is um, being focused on not just your your group or your industry. Um, Mm. So not just being focused on fraud and payments, but being focused on how what is important for your product or engineer or product or engineering org or what is important for your customer service organization your sales organization and having a full well-rounded understanding of what motivates each of those groups and figure out how you know you can tie that back to your team i think a lot of times fraud is an afterthought and Mm -hmm. how can you get in front of being the afterthought and i think it's by showing value and fraud and payments have tremendous value to all of these other teams inside of your organization, but you just need to figure out where it fits in, having that relationship and showing effectively and and doing it in a way that is um, genuine and authentic, but showing them why your group can add value and and how you can actually help them meet their goals. Um, I think you could probably take that across whatever industry you're in, um, but that's that's how I think I've been effective and I've been successful in my role. Um, and I try and give that advice to my teams and have them live that way as well. That's great advice. Heavy on the empathy. Love it. Yes. yes. <laughs> that's Leave awesome. Empathy for yeah. sure. Okay. Well, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to, to get to you know guys. you and yeah. to hear your story. It's Thank been you. great. And, and Askiwawa. Yes. I L L I N I. Yes, I, my three year olds will now do I N I when I say excellent. Yeah, yeah. So uh, raising them right. Yeah. Thank you guys. It was so so wonderful. I Thanks appreciate so much. It. Thanks excellent. for going easy on me. Yes. <laughs>